Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Conveners Group. Uh, can I welcome uh, Colette Stevenson, Convener of Social Justice and Social Security Committee, and John Mason, uh, Convener of the Finance and Public Administration Committee, to their first meetings uh, of the uh, group. We have received apologies from Jackson Carlaw, Convener of Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee, uh, and Sue Weber from Education, Children and Young People's Committee. Uh, the meeting will be held in public. Uh, your microphones will be uh, operated automatically. Um, COCAB is a new member, but COCAB has been a new member at the last meeting, would you not? Do you not hear? Oh, uh, the first with the First Minister. It's the first with the First Minister. Excellent. Well, welcome again. Um, so, agenda item one uh, is the meeting with the First Minister. Uh, so, you're very welcome, uh, First Minister. Um, and it's your first meeting in front of the conveners <laughs> group as well. So, uh, I a can number of firsts. That, yes. um, the meeting, um, we're aiming to um, uh, carry this for about uh, an hour and a half. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get through uh, all the questions in that time. Uh, we've agreed the focus of today's meeting will be on the priorities that you set out uh, in your statement uh, on the priorities for. For Scotland. Uh, however, uh, as always, uh, conveners may wish to raise uh, other uh, more general issues, and so there will be a bit of leeway applied in, in that regard. Um, some conveners have indicated that they wish to raise uh, more than one issue, and where that, that's the case, I've noted that in the order of priority. Uh, I'll do my best, as ever, to get in um, all the questions. Um, that will require uh, brevity in questions and in uh, responses as far as uh, possible. Uh, before we focus on the government's priorities, given this is the first time the First uh, Minister has met with the conveners group, I think it would be helpful if we could start with uh, some general issues uh, of interest to all the committees. And therefore, I'll start with some questions around uh, transparency of government and post-EU issues. Um, and I will invite first uh, Richard Leonard, uh, convener of the Public Audit Committee. Richard. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, first Minister, in your foreword to uh, new leadership, a fresh start, you say, I pledge to earn and re-earn the respect and trust of the people of Scotland. And you go on to say at the end of the document, it is imperative that transparency underpins our approach to delivery. My government will ensure the people of Scotland have the information they need uh, to hold us to account. In conducting uh, our inquiry into the ferries, vessels 801 and 802 over the last year, the Public Audit Committee has been met with ministerial non-cooperation, senior civil servants evading scrutiny, government bodies omitting evidence, or unable to find evidence, which then later turns up. So the public need to be assured that this will not happen again. Will you and the Permanent Secretary now mount a review of government accountability and transparency to Parliament. Uh, can I thank uh, Richard Leonard for the question? And before I answer it, can I say uh, my thanks to the uh, conveners group uh, for uh, the invitation? And I look forward to uh, what will be a wide ranging uh, discussion, uh, I'm sure. I can absolutely commit uh, to reviewing uh, and examining and looking at what more the government can do to be as transparent as possible. And there are, again, a range of areas that we can explore and examine. Uh, our response time to FOIs, for example, is something uh, I've already spoken to the Minister for Parliamentary Business and actually to ministers and cabinet secretaries right across the board. In terms of, of Ferguson's, I suppose the added complexity, and this is not uh, some sort of uh, excuse um, that, that I'm trying to leverage here, but there are issues, genuine issues around commercial sensitivity uh, and, of course, not putting the yard at a competitive disadvantage. We want the yard to continue to not just bid, but hopefully win contracts in the future. So there are some reports where the very firm advice is that if we release these uh, reports, for example, it would put the yard at a competitive disadvantage. But I take the point uh, that, that Richard Leonard uh, is making, more than happy to see what more can be done, not just around Ferguson's, but generally uh, in relation to uh, what more we can do to be as transparent uh, as possible. I think we have a good uh, record uh, on that, but I would like to see what more and what further we could do. Well, let me not dwell on uh, commercial matters then. Um, only today um, the committee published your government's response to our Ferries report, and uh, the committee still has to consider it, uh, but it was almost a week late. I don't know whether you've seen uh, the response uh, we got from your Minister for Transport or not. 
but it rather cherry picks and notes our recommendations uh, and conclusions using, I have to say, very few words uh, and says, frankly, uh, very little. So uh, really my question is to you, um, is this the kind of fresh start to transparency that we would expect? Uh, and uh, secondly, will you publish the findings of Barry Smith KC's investigation into whether the procurement process was rigged uh, as alleged in the BBC disclosure programme. Well, on that second uh, issue, of course, we take uh, those issues that were raised by the BBC uh, very, very seriously uh, indeed. That's why, of course, there is an investigation uh, underway. And again, I'm more than happy to look at what can be published, because I am absolutely committed to not just being transparent, but making sure that Parliament is updated as soon as we possibly can in relation to any issues, uh, let alone the ones uh, that we are discussing in regards to Ferguson's uh, shipyard. Uh, and an example of that, of course, would be that uh, you know, when, we, when, when the request came in uh, from the accountable officer for written authority, uh, we made sure that Parliament was updated via ministerial statement, uh, the first available opportunity. So we will stand up to take scrutiny, uh, of course, on these matters. I just go back to the point that there are some uh, areas and issues in relation to Ferguson's in particular that are commercially sensitive, that if we were to release completely unredacted, for example, some reports, then it would put Ferguson's at a competitive disadvantage. I'm happy to look at the request that Richard Leonard uh, has made, take some advice uh, on it, uh, but I am absolutely committed to being not just upfront and transparent, but making sure that Parliament is notified as soon as we possibly can on really important developments in relation to Ferguson's. I now call uh, John Mason, Finance and Public uh, uh, Administration Committee. John. Uh, thank you very much. Um, First Minister, we've had two recent bills, specifically the National Care Service Bill and the Children Care and Justice Bill, where the financial memorandums have not contained the best estimates of all the costs in the bill. And the government has committed to providing updated financial memorandums. Now, we accept that uh, there is often a lot of uncertainty about future costs around legislation. But can we have some assurance from the government that future financial memorandums will at least contain estimates of all the relevant costs? Uh, I think it's a really fair point that is raised by uh, John Mason, and, and absolutely. I want to see what more we can do to provide uh, as much uh, information to committees around the finances of important pieces of legislation. You've mentioned uh, a couple uh, there. Um, but I hope there's also an absolute understanding that those financial memorandums, those financial estimates may well develop as, for example, in the case of the National Care Service, we under, uh, undertake intensive engagement with stakeholders may well come, I hope, to a compromised position on some of the issues that local government and trade unions have raised in particular, and that will therefore have an impact uh, on the financial uh, memorandum. Uh, I appreciate that is uh, that, can, that can place the legislative timetable uh, into difficulty, and therefore your own uh, and other committees uh, around this table, uh, their, 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 their own processes and evidence-taking uh, timelines uh, can, can, can therefore, or will therefore uh, be affected. Uh, but I hope I can give an absolute assurance that, that we are ourselves reviewing internally what more we can do to provide uh, not just the best estimates possible, but if there are any potential revisions to those estimates, making sure that committees are informed uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I mean, I'm grateful for, for that response. And I mean, I think the committee accepts that, you know, best estimates is fine. I, th I think the problem is that in some cases we've not even had any estimates in some uh, specific areas. And, uh, you know, for example, there's been the suggestion that, well, if we predict uh, how many young people might end up in the court system, that's telling the courts what to do. Um, but I think our feeling would be that, um, you know, even a rough estimate, even if it's a range of estimates, just, just anything in that space is better than nothing. Fair. Um, and sticking with the transparency theme, I am now going to call uh, Claire Baker, um, Convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Claire. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I want to ask about committee scrutiny and the government's seemingly increasing preference for regulation rather than primary legislation. Um, the National Care Service Bill has already been mentioned, and one of the issues with that was it was a framework bill that is difficult for committees to scrutinise. Also, the introduction of the proposal for juryless trials, there's no details of the pilot to go with that when members consider the legislation. The one that's coming to my own committee, the Bankruptcy and Diligence Bill, it proposes a mental health moratorium, but again, that will be left to regulation. The bill doesn't specify what the moratorium 
would look like. So there is growing concern that this isn't enabling committees to provide proper scrutiny to legislation, that we are unable to really consider the substance of proposals that are being, for, being brought forward. So I'd be interested in how the First Minister responds to that and what the government's approach is to the balance between regulation and primary legislation. And I think that word balance is so important uh, because I think everybody around this table will recognise that there will be some instances where uh, the use of, of regulation will absolutely be necessary. And, and we're equally, as a government, we should be open to that challenge back from committee to say, actually, uh, this should not be in secondary legislation. Um, but let's take you know, an, an example or two that um, Claire Baker rightly uh, references in her contribution. So take, for example... Um, what is in the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill, the jury trials, the pilot, the time-limited pilot that was uh, recommended by, by, by Lady Dorian uh, and that we are keen to progress. It's so, so important that we have the ability, I believe, uh, to be able to work with survivors groups, the legal profession and others to really work through what are you know, really challenging issues that require to hear each side uh, because each side, frankly, makes very valid arguments around uh, the pros and cons of, 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 of uh, uh, single-judge uh, uh, trials. Um, uh, what, what I think we should absolutely be open to uh, in government... I'm uh, sorry, what, what I should say in that regard is what we shouldn't then have to do is once we get to an agreement with, I hope, uh, both the legal profession and also those... Uh, who represent survivors uh, of rape uh, and others, of course, who are important in this, we wouldn't want to go back through the primary legislative process all over again. Um, and so there's that balance, that word that Claire Baker uses uh, rightly, that we have to try to strike. Um, what, what, I'd be mo what I'm always open to, and I think this government has been uh, open to, certainly in bills that I have taken forward uh, in, in previous roles, is how do we enhance that scrutiny? Uh, by Parliament uh, on these really important issues, again, taking uh, single judge trials uh, as an example. So, for example, you know, if it's committee's recommendation, do we bring forward a super affirmative uh, order? So that gives additional enhanced scrutiny to the Parliament. We should be as open to that from a government perspective as we possibly can, particularly in areas where we are trying to get that balance right between, well, actually not having to go through primary legislation again and all of the time uh, that involves uh, uh, versus, uh, of course, a, a, a secondary legislation for a really important uh, matter indeed. So I'm hoping we can just work our way through those various issues that Claire Baker raises. But from a government perspective and from my perspective as First Minister, we should be very open to uh, any committee suggestion of additional enhanced scrutiny. Um, just yeah, to come back, while, while the jurors' trials is obviously a key issue, the bill that we are looking at is the Bankruptcy and Diligence uh, Bill on the Mental Health Moratorium. Um, and it will be interesting in where, why the government feel when they have to bring forward legislation that is necessary and when actually there should be more time taken to let MSPs know what it is we're planning to actually pass legislation on. Yeah. Um, the issue of scrutiny for you, because it's harder to build consensus if people don't know what it is they're actually voting for. And that seems to be a greater trend because things are left to regulations or the detail isn't there in the bill as it goes through Parliament. Um, so to gain greater you know, support of Parliament, either there's a commitment for the regulations to be available before stage three often, that can help. But for the government to recognise sometimes MSPs are put in a position they're being asked to, it might be something they broadly support, but it's difficult to vote for something if you don't actually know the detail of it. I think that's very, very common indeed. And in, in, on the particular issue uh, around the bankruptcy uh, bill that's mentioned by Claire Baker, let me take that away and see if there's something that we can provide again in advance uh, of uh, further stages of parliamentary uh, scrutiny. Uh, more than happy, and again, in, in, in passing many bills in my time, uh, over the years, uh, as, as a Minister and Cabinet Secretary, we've often provided draft regulations in advance, uh, or there have been occasions, I should say, where we've provided draft regulation uh, in advance. I'd be more than happy to see on this occasion if that is something that can uh, be done uh, genuinely. I think it always is a balance uh, when it comes to secondary legislation. There'll be some issues that will not be of any contention between committee and government that uh, everybody accepts should be done by, via secondary legislation. There are some areas, of course, where uh, we should be willing to work with committee uh, to try to find a resolution as best we possibly can. But I think the comments uh, that uh, Claire Baker makes are, are, are fair. Thank you.
Much, um, we're going to move on from transparency to post-EU and international government relations, but stay, stick with the Clare theme. Uh, I'm going to invite Clare Adamson, Convener of Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy First uh, Deputy. Presiding officer, sorry. First Minister, a key consideration of our committee has been, in this session has been the effectiveness of intergovernmental relations, especially in the new constitutional reality of being outside of the EU. So I would like your initial thoughts as First Minister on how well intergovernment relations agreement is working. And given that IGR operates primarily within a private and confidential space. How is we, as conveners and committees of this parliament, engage in that process? Mm -hmm. um, I think on, on, on the second point, the latter point around how the parliament uh, engages, again, I would be up for a, a conversation about what we can share. There obviously has to be a, a, a safe space, I think, for those inter intergovernmental discussions to happen. Uh, in, with, with some degree of confidence and confidentiality um, to have that free and frank exchange of view. Uh, but I do think it's very fair that our parliaments and uh, respective parliaments uh, are able to, to question, scrutinise uh, where necessary. So again, I've taken a note of seeing what more we may be able to do uh, in order to ensure that uh, there is, again, uh, going back to, to Richard Leonard's point, as much transparency around these uh, matters as, as possible. In terms of the, the IGR uh, itself, I mean, look, as a, as, as a structure, you know, I think it, it works on, on, on paper. I think it's more the culture as opposed to the actual structure. So I've, I've had a couple of conversations now um, with the Prime Minister, uh, of course, with uh, other UK uh, government uh, ministers uh, as well. And we'll continue to have those conversations uh, and, and, and also with uh, Welsh counterparts. Uh, as well. Um, and I think what frustrates me is, although uh, in the conversations I have had with uh, the Prime Minister, um, he's been willing to listen to the arguments that we'll put forward, um, it seems to me that there's a, a continual undermining of our devolution. And, and that, to me, is of great worry. So you can have all the processes and structures in place that the IGR gives you. You can have all the warm words. Um, you can you can you can have all the, the the cordial meetings in the world, but if, for example, we are being undermined, this parliament is being undermined, and in my view, it absolutely is. Whether it's through not granting the exemption to the Internal Markets Act, well, the Internal Markets Act as a whole, I have to say, um, whether it's uh, the use of the Seoul Convention, of course, there, there wasn't a use of the Seoul Convention um, uh, before uh, 2016. There's been uh, several breaches. Uh, thereafter, uh, the use of Section 35 order, retained EU law bill, and so on and so forth. There's many examples uh, I could give that is of serious concern. And I have to say, and I, I would, I'm not breaking any confidences here because um, the individual has said this publicly, uh, these are very much views that are shared, shared by the Welsh First Minister uh, and the Welsh Government uh, as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, one here in relation to that uh, undermining of devolution. In fact, it was the it was the topic on the top of the agenda when uh, the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, and I uh, first met. Of course, all of these issues have been of concern to the committee. We have published a number of reports with regards to rule and other areas. But one of the reports we did was on the excellent positive work of our international offices and missions. Um, since that time, the Foreign Secretary has written to embassies uh, to limit the Scottish Government's overseas engagements um, and possibly, with the great work they do, possibly damage trade and investment. Do you have any reflections on that? I think people know, my reflections, it was an incredibly uh, clumsy intervention by uh, the Foreign uh, Secretary, and I said as much uh, to the Prime Minister when we last met. Uh, it really just works against that kind of Team Scotland approach. I fully respect that the, you know, there is a, a, a difference of opinion, a wide range of views around, for example, Scotland's constitutional uh, future. Um, but we don't purport to speak to, to uh, on anybody else's behalf but the Scottish uh, governments. And I have to say, um, it is not a topic of conversation uh, when we are, for example, uh, or not often a topic of conversation, uh, when we are having uh, meetings around trade and, and investment um, with foreign partners. Uh, they're interested in how we can increase uh, 
uh, trade and investment. Uh, they're interested in what more we can do around educational exchange, around cultural exchange, what more we can do in relation to international development, where despite having a relatively small uh, pot, of, pot, pot of money, we can uh, make a huge transformational uh, change. And of course, if we are asked our opinion uh, around uh, the constitution and our own views, we'll always be clear that these are the views of the Scottish Government. And of course, the UK Government will have a difference of opinion uh, on that constitutional matter and other matters such as um, Brexit and so on uh, and so forth. And I have to say, if my kind of early engagement with ambassadors and others is anything to go by, uh, I have to say that the, the feeling is that uh, there is a great degree of warmth towards Scotland continuing that international engagement. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to call uh, Stuart McMillan, Convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considers certain bills based on the reports from the Scottish Law Commission. Uh, and uh, obviously, recently, the Parliament recently passed the Movable Transactions Bill and we're currently looking at the Trusts and Succession Bill. Now, both these bills will need a uh, Scotland Act Section 104 order mm. uh, to uh, be agreed between both Scottish and UK governments uh, to bring the proposals fully into force by making consequential changes to reserved law. Now, would a formal protocol between both governments be of assistance and be of help to ensure that there is a full implementation of the SLC bills? I'm certainly uh, open again to, to consider whether formal protocol could uh, help matters. There is a process uh, already uh, very much uh, in place and it can often depend on case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, the subject complexity, the subject matter, uh, as I say, the complexity of drafting, uh, securing uh, UK parliamentary time, these are all really material considerations which we have to take. Uh, into uh, an account, and uh, because of that, both governments tend to work on the basis that an order would require what 12 to 18 months, uh, mm -hmm. roughly, uh, from inception to then being made. So we we'll always identify the need for such orders as early as we possibly can in the bill process. But um, as I say, that will often have to be done on a, a, a case by case um, basis. Though I do understand very legitimate concerns um, that uh, you raise, um, and, and we'll do everything we can do to ensure that Section 104 orders. Um, that are deemed necessary uh, are, are, are progressed, or, well, first of all, identified uh, and then progressed as early as we possibly can. Uh, but I will, uh, you have asked me to give consideration to a formal protocol. I will uh, take that away and, and give some consideration to whether that would uh, necessarily help uh, uh, movement on Section 104s. Well, thank you, Mr. So, following on from the, uh, the questions from Claire Adamson regarding the IGR, I think uh, in this particular area, um, it's clear that both Scottish and UK governments actually have been working uh, well together uh, regarding the Section 104 orders. But uh, as you indicated there yourself, uh, First Minister, uh, the, the length of time it can take uh, for them, that's the, the, that appears to be a problem or a, a challenge. And um, I think the, the feeling from the committee uh, is very much uh, if that could be, uh, whether it's a protocol or certainly if that could be uh, sped up, to say the least. Um, that would also it would aid uh, uh, those who are going to be the, the practitioners uh, of the legislation, so they can then uh, utilise that quicker, better, uh, for uh, better outcomes for their population. Yeah, and I think we, we've always got to be mindful of um, your own committees collectively, uh, the, the, the pressures on your timetable, which I know can, can often be tight, and we do our best and work well with clerks. Uh, right across uh, various different uh, committees uh, in that respect. But if there's anything else that can be done uh, to speed up that process, particularly in relation to Section 104s uh, that you have mentioned, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take a look, uh, whether that's a formal protocol or, or something else. Um, it's well worth uh, us considering. So I will, I will take that one away. Thank you. Um, so next, Finlay Carson, uh, Convener of Rural Affairs and Islands Committee. Thank, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning or good afternoon, First Minister. Um, my, my question, my first question is around the retained EU law revocation and reform bill and uh, the Scottish Government's approach to retaining EU law and devolved competence. Uh, my committee, the Rural Affairs and Islands and the Net Zero Committee are likely to have the bulk of the legislation uh, and it's our role to hold the, the Scottish Government to account. Uh, I understand that the, UK, uh, the, the Scottish Government will have to work with the UK on an intergovernmental approach to this, but as a convener of a Scottish Parliament committee, it's concerning that we've had no indication of the work that the Scottish Government have 
undertaken to this point or any, any indication of uh, the Scottish Government's approach in relation to uh, the Scottish Parliament and the role that Parliament committees have in that process? Well, well, you'll, you'll note that, that uh, of course, there has been uh, some change in relation to uh, the EU retained uh, law, uh, retained EU law bill, uh, in terms of the UK government's uh, own uh, timetable uh, in that respect. But I'm more than happy to examine in detail, or maybe uh, understand from uh, Finlay Carson, uh, in particular, more granular detail, uh, where he feels that there is a, a gap in terms of the information that's been provided or if he feels that uh, overall the information that is coming from government is, is not of a quality or standard or sufficiency, uh, I'm more than happy to see what we can do to rectify that. I, I won't go into the... I think you know our position well on uh, retained EU law uh, bill um, and uh, where we think it overreaches uh, significantly, but also, frankly, uh, could end up uh, really... Uh, having a detrimental impact on standards, particularly in agriculture, uh, where, where, where we have a real key concern. But I'm happy to, to look at specifics of Finlay Carson. You can provide them just now, or even, of course, uh, I'll make sure that my office reaches into uh, the clerks to understand a bit better um, where, they, where, where, where the information provided uh, feels insufficient. Um, it, I, I suppose it's not that it's insufficient, it's just not there. Mm. We have no indication of how... Uh, the Scottish Government would like to see the committees approach the work in the future that's almost certainly to come. So it's not about the quality of the information or how it's coming to us, the fact that we, we don't have any information at all. Um, I would like to move on to a, another question. Um, this morning my committee took evidence on Ireland's plan and, and one really important topic within that is depopulation. Uh, and the contributing factors uh, include the lack of housing, uh, the ferries, the impact of HPMAs, but also digital infrastructure, uh, you know, given the hugely significant impact that broadband, or, or more importantly, the lack of broadband has on the sustainability of rural communities. Uh, now, we know that communication regulations are reserved, um, but the physical deployment infrastructure is devolved to each of the nations. So on that basis, can you tell us why R100, which was a flagship project, which was supposed to be completed by the end of 2021, has gone so badly wrong, and we're now looking at the end of 2028 in some instances. So as a First Minister, what can you do to accelerate the programme and give rural communities assurances that the commitment that was given by the Scottish Government will be delivered? And will you also commit to a review of R100 to identify why it's gone so wrong? So uh, it won't be a surprise to Finlay Carson that I disagree uh, with his characterisation characterization of R100, and I'll come to that uh, very shortly. Um, I know from various different ministerial portfolios uh, that have had, uh, particularly as Minister for Transport uh, and the Islands, just how much of a concerning issue depopulation in our remote rural and island communities uh, absolutely is. And Finlay Carson was right to uh, give uh, and to articulate uh, the range of factors that cause uh, depopulation. Um, so we are committed as a government to having that cross-governmental approach. Uh, we know how important housing and affordable housing it is. That's why one of the first announcements I made was around additional funding uh, in relation to the purchase of empty properties back into the social rented sector. We think that can help, particularly in rural uh, communities, um, in, 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 in addition to uh, giving local authorities more power in relation to council tax and second homes. Um, so we, we are really uh, keen to work on a range of these issues, but take a cross-governmental uh, approach. Um, there's no doubt when I travel to remote rural and island communities, a number of issues uh, will come up and where we can work with the UK government on these issues, we'd be keen to do so. And we're not, I'm afraid, unfortunately, going to be able to convince uh, the UK government, it seems, to, of the folly of, of Brexit. But there's no doubt that that has had uh, an impact, uh, as well as migration policy. We're really, uh, frankly, desperate to see if we can get the UK government to, to, to see sense in, for example, extension of the rural uh, visa uh, pilot. Uh, but also uh, what more can be done around migration to help the population. So there's a whole range of issues that are in, in our gift in the government. I accept that. It's somewhere we'd be keen to collaborate and work closely with the UK government. In terms of R100, it's a fair uh, question to ask, because digital connectivity is so, so important, not just for individuals, but for businesses uh, in remote, rural and island um, communities. Uh, look, I'm absolutely committed to making sure that uh, uh, the progress we have made with R100, which is exceptional in terms of the investment that we've made the coverage we now have uh, is continued. Uh, there have been a number of uh, reasons uh, why 
uh, R100 uh, didn't meet that initial uh, target. There's undoubtedly, of course, the impact uh, of, of COVID. We know uh, that would have had in a whole range of projects, uh, but I'm very, very keen. He asked for a review uh, in terms of, 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 of getting it back on, on track. I make an absolute commitment <coughs> to do everything we can within our gift and within our power uh, to make sure that digital connectivity uh, is, is, is countrywide, including our remote uh, rural and island communities, but it wasn't. If it wasn't for our investment, there are many parts of the country that would be in a complete digital black spot. Uh, if it wasn't for the significant investment of the Scottish government, so uh, yes, I'm absolutely keen to see what more uh, we can do uh, to make sure that program uh, delivers for remote rural and island, and island communities across the country. Thank you. That's a neat segue into the themes of community equality and uh, opportunity. And with that, I'm going to invite Ariane Burgess, convener, local government, uh, housing and planning committee, to lead with the next questions on community. Ariane. Thanks, convener, and uh, good afternoon, first minister. Uh, as part of our work around the local governance review and the New Deal for local government. <coughs> My committee recently held a very constructive event with Scottish Futures Forum. We were looking at the building of the relationships between local and central government. And from this, the committee believes that the agreement of a new deal between local and central government is absolutely essential. That view, uh, as you probably know, is also, has also been expressed by the Accounts Commission. And while we appreciate that it is appropriate for time to be taken to get the new deal right, we also uh, are concerned that there needs to be a renewed level of urgency to the agreement. And I'd be keen to hear from you what you're doing to uh, give uh, momentum to the New Deal. Uh, also, uh, from our conversations at the event, there were some clear principles that uh, came to light. Um, and we heard that local government is looking for a clear and a clear and enforceable demarcations of roles, more freedom to operate flexibly in ways that respond to the specific needs of their localities, recognising that Scotland is one of the most centralised countries in Europe, and more certainty of funding. So I'd be interested to hear uh, in that regard what you're doing to ensure that these principles are shaping the New Deal. And uh, finally, uh, we do have this local democracy bill that is um, uh, um, listed for this session, and I'd be interested to hear uh, if you can commit to that, because I think this is an important uh, vehicle for which we can um, give effect to the deal and as well as empowering communities further. First Minister. Thank you so much. I'm just taking a note of all uh, three parts of the question. Uh, for me, uh, first and foremost, let me give uh, an absolute commitment around the urgency required and the pace required for the New Deal uh, from government. Uh, in fact, the very first meeting I had as First Minister with an external stakeholder was with COSLA uh, and the COSLA president. Uh, and uh, that was uh, not uh, by coincidence, but very much by design in order to uh, reiterate and communicate to our partners and local government the urgency required to get a New Deal uh, over the line. Uh, I also had another uh, meeting uh, with them just a, a couple of weeks ago alongside uh, the Deputy First Minister. Um, alongside the, the, the COSLA, uh, along, along with the COSLA presidential uh, team. And I have to say it was one of the most positive meetings uh, I've had in my time uh, in government uh, with COSLA. There was a, a shared endeavour and desire to try to get movement on the new deal as quick as possible. So I've got a fair degree uh, of confidence uh, that we'll get a new deal in place. Uh, but as with any deal or negotiation, it is that, that f those final couple of hurdles that are sometimes the most difficult to, to overcome, where you've got to absolutely concentrate your effort and, and frankly, where there's got to be compromises on, on, on all sides in that regard. So it is that final kind of strait that we're in, um, which is, is, is going to sometimes is going to, I think, uh, be, be the most challenging. But I'm very confident that we'll get to a new deal and we'll get to one, uh, hopefully, uh, soon. Uh, in terms of uh, the the principles, uh, they're ones that that absolutely have been uh, brought to the table uh, by uh, local government and ones that I uh, absolutely want to see embedded as part of the new deal. Like the, the number one issue, uh, and I don't think again I'm giving away uh, any secrets here at all. The number one issue uh, that uh, local government uh, bring to the table uh, is wanting that flexibility. They want to be, uh, they, they they want to agree with government in relation to the outcomes where, where we have shared outcomes uh, in relation to reduction of poverty and reducing educational uh, the the gap, educational attainment gap, for example. But they want to do that in a way that gives them the maximum amount of flexibility. And that comes to trust, comes down to the issue of trust between national government and local government. And I absolutely trust our local government partners 
to deliver uh, on uh, these uh, outcomes. So uh, those principles uh, for me are, are, are absolutely uh, important. So we do remain committed uh, with working with COSLA um, and we want to also conclude that local government governance review within this parliament we promised uh, to do that and, and the review is considering how power and resources could be shared between national and local government um, and that's uh, linked to that new deal that I've already uh, spoken to uh, spoken about uh, and of course if that requires if the findings of the review require legislative change uh, then of course we'll seek to introduce these changes absolutely within uh, this session um, thank you very much for your response and um, yeah, I think it is that parity of esteem that's really important that we need to be looking at so that we're, we, we move away from what I perceive as and the committee perceives as a bit of a hierarchical uh, way of thinking about national government and local government and I think one of the things that really came up clearly at our event is stepping away from the idea that local government is a delivery agent but mm. actually they're really clearly partners in what we're trying to do for people in Scotland. Well, I agree with that and, and, and we're trying to talk about spheres of government as opposed to tiers of government, which I know is really important for, 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 for local government. So I see us as partners. Uh, as I say, we're making really good progress in that new deal. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can get a conclusion to that uh, relatively soon, and I hope it will reflect the principles that um, uh, Adrian Burgess has, uh, has so well articulated. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Jim Fairley, Convener of COVID-19 Recovery Committee, to lead with the next questions, Jim. Thank you, President Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, you'll be aware the National Incident Management Team recently met to discuss the latest, COVID, the latest position on COVID-19 in Scotland and has agreed that it will no longer meet. Um, this follows other recent developments such as the separate threat level for COVID no longer being produced by the government. So in light of these events, could you set out how COVID-19 and recovery fit into the priorities for the new government and who will be leading on them? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it is a really uh, good and important uh, question and involved in this, obviously, in my previous role uh, as Health Secretary. We are absolutely in a different phase of uh, the pandemic. I think everybody uh, can recognise that COVID hasn't gone away and the impacts of COVID can still be felt. I know my uh, successor is, 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 is Health Secretary. Um, you know, th th there are challenges whenever we have an outbreak or an uptick in COVID cases uh, that impacts not just those that are coming to hospital uh, due to the effects of COVID, but of course the staff uh, as well who don't want to, who want to ensure they're not spreading COVID uh, in busy hospital uh, wards and so can really have an impact um, most acutely seen, I think, in our, in our hospital sites. Um, so, so COVID recovery, uh, which is at work, uh, continuing to be led uh, by, well, in fact, by uh, uh, almost every uh, minister and, and cabinet secretary, uh, but of course the health secretary and NHS recovery, health and social care secretary uh, has uh, lead in terms of health care. Uh, the deputy first minister still will have that overview uh, across government in relation to a, a recovery uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19. It should be said, uh, Almost all of the empirical evidence and data tells us that we would expect uh, there to, to uh, continue to be uh, pandemics uh, in the future. Uh, and of course, we uh, have established that standing committee on pandemics, uh, which will continue to inform uh, our response and preparedness to any future pandemics that may arise. You have led me perfectly on to my second question. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll be aware that at our last meeting, we heard from Professor Morris and Professor Evans from the Standing Committee and Pandemic Preparedness Group, and it was a very interesting session. Uh, one thing that came out of that, well, there's two things that came out of that. One was the fact that the, both professors stated that we could not be expecting to be one in a hundred years anymore. We had to think differently. Uh, but also, he, he, Professor Morris in particular, on three occasions mentioned the importance of this committee, and he was meaning the COVID Recovery Committee. Now, we've had the, the interim report published in August, and the Scottish Government's response from the previous First Minister was, uh, she said, we will work with the committee and partners across the public sector and in industry and our research institutions to take them forward and ensure that Scotland is as well placed as it can be to meet the pandemic threats of the future. Now, obviously, since then, there's been uh, changes in portfolios. And it doesn't appear, COVID recovery doesn't appear under Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care's remit. So given all the lessons that we have been learning throughout the pandemic and the importance of being prepared, 
Should another pandemic arrive, can you confirm whether pandemic preparedness is still a priority for the Scottish Government? And who in the Scottish Government is responsible for taking the interim reports recommendations forward? So a couple, couple of points I would make. Remember our NHS uh, recovery plan, which is a recovery from COVID-19. It's a five-year plan. Uh, and it's a plan that, of course, uh, and, and you'll notice, of course, uh, uh, the change in the title uh, of Michael Matheson role as Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, uh, as well as uh, Health and <coughs> Social Care. So he will absolutely drive forward that NHS recovery work. And, and in terms of the committee, it's for uh, the Parliament to decide the work and the committee to decide its own, own work, of course. But uh, that recovery from the pandemic, even though we are not at the height of the pandemic, will still take years. I don't, I don't know anybody who suggests that recovery from the pandemic uh, will just take weeks or months. It will take years not just for our NHS, but the impacts on our economy and so on and so forth. So we've got to, we've got to have a broad uh, overview in, in, in that respect. In terms of future resilience, um, you'll note you'll note in, in, in responsibilities uh, for Cabinet Secretaries, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home Affairs continues to have uh, responsibility for resilience uh, issues, regardless of what those res resilience issues uh, are, including um, uh, potential uh, future pandemics. But in relation to that overview, uh, uh, across government uh, on, on on recovery, uh, I've asked the Deputy First Minister to, to have that overview, that cross government overview, uh, in relation to making sure the recovery uh, continues uh, and taking over from the good work that her predecessor did uh, in that regard. Thank you. Ken. Thank you, Jim. Um, we're now joined by uh, one of our colleagues who's joining us remotely, uh, Edward Mountain, Convener Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Edward, over to you. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Convener, and uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, as you'll know, First Minister, the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee has nearly finished our ferries inquiry. And at the weekend, we heard that Turner and Townsend have been appointed at a reputed cost of £4 million to review the Clyde and Hebrides ferries contract, which is due to be tendered for in 2024, uh, and specifically CalMAC's role in that. Could you clarify what their remit is and when they will report? Because uh, I think it would be very helpful for the committee. So, first of all, uh, when it comes to uh, the contract, the CHIS uh, contract, uh, we are, of course, very committed to, to the successful development of the next generation of that uh, contract. It's vital for our island communities. Uh, that, that, of course, a lifeline, as it is often rightly described. And I have to say, it's very routine practice uh, for us to use specialist external uh, advisors when it comes to uh, complex, particularly high-value projects, uh, such as this one, to help ensure that the contract meets, need, uh, meets our needs uh, and delivers value uh, for money. Um, in addition to engaging uh, with our various stakeholders, including the communities that are served by this contract, uh, our external advisors will help to ensure that the development of the contract uh, includes industry's best practices to deliver a service that meets current and future uh, requirements, something we're very uh, committed to. In terms of uh, giving detail on what can be published, uh, I'm happy to take that uh, uh, ask away uh, and see what we can possibly publish, given that this is a uh, piece of live work that is already underway uh, in relation to a future contract. Uh, I'm more than happy to see what can be published uh, to be as open and transparent in that regard as possible. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, I'm conscious we're making good progress, but got quite a number of questions to get through. So again, I'll reiterate my plea for brevity in questions and responses as far as possible. We move on to the uh, equality theme. We stick in the virtual domain uh, and uh, we go over to our second colleague joining us remotely, Claire Hockey, um, Convener Health, Social Care and Sport. Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, last month, First Minister, the Scottish Government announced an extension to the Stage 1 deadline for the National Care Service Scotland Bill, and the Minister for Social Care recently attended the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee on this subject. I wonder, can the First Minister outline the engagement the Scottish Government has had and will have with trade unions and COSLA during the Stage 1 extension? How long he anticipates the engagement at this stage will last before moving on to the next stage of the bill and when the financial memorandum of the bill will be updated. Um, the engagement uh, has, has started the, and it will be an intense period, in, intensive uh, period of engagement over the course 
uh, of the summer months. I should say, uh, having worked very closely, obviously, on this bill and closely with uh, Kevin Stewart, who was previously the minister uh, in charge and uh, leading the bill, um, there has been and always there, there has always been a really good engagement with local authorities right from inception stage and with our trade union partners. But it's become very clear that they have particular issues. Uh, and, and I think it, it is, again, safe for me to, to, to say that those issues tend to centre on uh, the employment of staff, uh, locally employed uh, staff. Um, that is the area that we're focused on in terms of trying to find a, a compromise solution. So how do you have a national care service that has those national terms and conditions, consistency of standards, sectoral bargaining and so on and so forth? How do you have that national framework but at the same time have staff that are locally employed. I think I don't, I don't think that's beyond our, our wit to get to a compromise position uh, uh, collectively uh, on that. But that will have a bearing then, uh, which is a segue to the second part of Claire Hockey's question. It will have a bearing undoubtedly in the financial uh, memorandum uh, and, and, and we will um, come back with that uh, revision once that uh, engagement, I hope, comes to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Um, at the end of last year, the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee published a report on tackling health inequalities in Scotland. And we know that the pandemic has exacerbated health inequalities and the ongoing cost of living crisis widens those inequalities even further. So can the First Minister advise what steps the Scottish Government is taking to target support for people whose social circumstances have a negative impact on their health? Well, again, uh, you know, the committee's uh, excellent work on this uh, over uh, over the years actually uh, just confirms what we know in regards to poverty uh, being, uh, unfortunately, the common thread when it comes to uh, health inequalities. Uh, so the government has taken a range of actions uh, in that regard. I won't go through all of them, but uh, you know, you can see the work that we've done uh, in relation to tackling, for example, uh, alcohol and problem. Uh, drinking in relation to, to, to alcohol, the work we've done targeting um, smoking cessation, again, uh, lung cancer, uh, uh, particularly affecting those in areas of higher uh, deprivation. And then, of course, there's all the work that we're doing to try to reduce poverty and being very targeted. So the likes of the Scottish Child Payment, for example, uh, the Fuel Insecurity Fund and many, many uh, more. I suppose the frustration in all of this is that um, you know, we can do all of that, but we are still beholden to decisions that are made by uh, the UK government. So if they choose to take away the uplift of £20 of, mm -hmm. from universal credit, then that has a, can, undoubtedly has an impact uh, in relation to, 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 to poverty, as well as you know the bedroom tax and so on and so forth. So there are many, many uh, areas of uh, UK government policy, which you know don't need to take my word for it. You can see from... Uh, many uh, independent uh, experts in the third sector who will tell you have a real significant impact. But uh, whatever we can do uh, within our gift in the Scottish Government, we will do to try to reduce those health inequalities. And there's still um, a bit, uh, you know, there's still some some work, significant work for us to to do in that regard. First Minister, I'm now going to invite Cocap Stewart, Convener of Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee, to lead the next questions. Cocap. Thank you, Convener. Um, the Equalities Committee are currently undertaking a short inquiry on human rights of those seeking asylum in Scotland. Against the backdrop um, of the current conflict in Sudan, can the First Minister advise what preparations are underway by the Scottish Government to welcome asylum seekers from Sudan who may wish to make their home in Scotland? Uh, look, I really look forward to seeing the outcome of that uh, uh, inquiry uh, that is being undertaken uh, by the committee. This is an issue uh, that I think is of interest to, to many of us, um, and particularly been an interest of mine um, for many years. And uh, I, I, you know, I really do despair. I have to say, at the uh, current um, discussions around uh, migration from the UK government and indeed others. Uh, as well. I, I just don't think uh, we look at this in a way that, uh, frankly, is through the prism of um, compassion, but also, if I was to be even more kind of hard-nosed about it, actually what's in our economic interest in relation to uh, migration uh, as well. And, and just one example in relation to asylum seekers, I think most of us as MSPs and certainly our MP colleagues uh, will have known many a constituents' case where 
somebody has been in the asylum process for years, years, and not had the right to work. It's just mind-boggling uh, for the individual who wants to work and for our economy, of course, in relation to additional tax receipts uh, as well. In terms of what we're doing uh, to prepare, there's a number of things uh, that uh, we, we are doing. So we have the New Scots uh, strategy, uh, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, is the strategy uh, that a number of local authorities uh, will help to guide local authorities in relation to uh, refugees uh, and asylum seekers that come uh, to the country. Um, I've also spoken to the Prime Minister uh, around the situation in Sudan and, and of course, as part of that conversation, uh, uh, he updated me on their own plans uh, in regards to, 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 to refugees and, of course, um, I've made it clear that uh, we think the number one thing the UK government could do is make sure there's safe uh, routes for migration. Um, if you don't have safe legal routes for migration, uh, you end up with unsafe illegal routes um, for, 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 for migration. The Cabinet Secretary for External Affairs is also run to the Foreign Secretary um, to put uh, on record our, our deep concern for people at risk uh, in Sudan and, and um, again, asking them to do more in relation to those safe legal uh, routes uh, and uh, sorry that uh, in terms of the humanity situation in Sudan, uh, th it's, it's a cabinet secretary for social, uh, it's a, ca a cabinet secretary uh, for social justice who's written to the Home Secretary, uh, her counterpart, uh, in relation to the legal routes uh, as well. So there's things that we can absolutely do, uh, and we've had some regular engagement with particularly local authorities, uh, where we where we uh, would expect uh, uh, refugees uh, to to come initially. Um, so there's been some regular engagement with Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, in particular uh, with some of the diaspora communities, uh, Sudanese diaspora communities uh, that are there who are obviously, uh, many of them quite understandably, uh, exercised and want to see their family who are still in Sudan uh, join them uh, in, the, in the UK. Cool um, uh, I thank you for that very full answer. I was going to go on to ask about uh, your communications with the UK Government, bearing in mind that immigration and areas concerning refugees and asylum seekers are reserved matters. Um, uh, but I think that, First Minister, you've given a very comprehensive answer. Um, was there anything else, any other further communications that have taken place? But I don't think so. Well, the extensive answer case. is that I, I haven't needed case. to repeat my, my, my plea for brevity, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Kokab. I'm now going to ask Colette Stevenson, uh, Convener, Social Justice and Social Security um, Committee, to proceed with the next questions, Colette. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I was pleased to see that the first mission set out in the First Minister's vision for Scotland relates to tackling poverty and protecting people from harm. One of the key policies the Scottish Government has <coughs> introduced, which is unique in the UK, is, of course, the Scottish Child Payment. Cara Hilton of the Trussell Trust told the Social Justice Committee earlier this month during an evidence session on the cost of living crisis and its impact on lone parents. She says, we know that the policy is starting to make a difference because our annual parcel figures, which came out last week, show that there was a much lower percentage increase in the number of parcels for children from November 22 to March 23. So that is really encouraging news, but she says it's not an excuse for complacency. So I'd be interested to hear the First Minister's response to this, and we'd also appreciate if he could provide an update on the Anti-Poverty Summit he convened earlier this month. And finally, if he could actually commit to continue to engage with the cross-party leaders, experts, and most importantly, those with direct experience of poverty to find better solutions. Uh, thank you uh, for those um, questions. I thought um, that quote that you read out uh, from Cara Hilton, who I have to say I've worked with um, over the years and in the past, and I have a tremendous amount uh, of respect for. Um, there was probably two things that stood out um, for me uh, in that quote. Um, one was the phrase, there was a much lower percentage increase, but that still then refers, of course, to a percentage increase. So we're still dealing with uh, the impacts and effects of, of, of poverty, particularly in the uh, cost of living crisis uh, that has beset. Uh, this country and that I'm afraid is uh, impacting uh, and affecting the most vulnerable uh, in ways that we all know because we all, we all have engaged with our constituents uh, but in a way that seems uh, frankly shameful in, in, in the 21st um, century. The second 
um, phrase within that quote uh, was uh, that's no excuse for complacency. I, mean, I kind of double underline that because I think that's absolutely right. Um, we haven't seen the far, we haven't seen the full set of figures from uh, the latest rise in the Scottish child payment. Uh, payment. Uh, I, I would be surprised if those figures, when they do come out, don't show. I hope. Uh, a reduction uh, in poverty, child poverty uh, in particular. Uh, but uh, even if that is the case, nobody in government will be taking their foot off the gas when it comes to tackling poverty and child poverty in particular, because the rates of child poverty uh, are still far too high uh, in our country. But I want to pay uh, tribute to my uh, predecessor in particular, who uh, brought forward that Scottish child payment. Um, you know, it comes uh, at a, a significant cost in relation to our budget, but it's it worth every single penny, uh, given the impact I believe it's having uh, on tackling poverty and child poverty uh, in particular. Uh, there are a range of other um, measures that we're taking over and uh, above and beyond the Scottish child payment. I'm not going to the detail of them. I think uh, I've already uh, mentioned some of them in uh, response to a, a previous question. Um, in terms of the anti-poverty summit, um, I, I was very keen to make it clear that I don't want the poverty anti-poverty summit to be a talking shop. Uh, we can all gather, have uh, cups of tea, nice discussions, but actually there's no follow-up. None of us wanted that, and, and in fact that was the, the demand from the third sector and also those with direct experience of poverty. Um, so we're intending to follow up, uh, perhaps into subgroups and, and uh, uh, smaller groups that are focused on particular avenues and tasks. Uh, what, I, what I've said from a government perspective, whatever lever, levers we have uh, in respect to the devolution uh, settlement, the Scotland Act, we will do everything to use those powers to their maximum effect. So that includes taxation, absolutely. Um, that includes um, being targeted where we have to uh, be. And I think that's uh, uh, sensible for us to examine and explore. And then making some really difficult decisions because we do have a finite budget, budget in the constitutional setup. We're in, notwithstanding uh, some levers we have, the vast majority of those fiscal levers remain with the UK government. So we have that fixed, uh, relatively, uh, for, for the most part, a fixed budget um, with very limited uh, borrowing costs and certainly not for day-to-day -day spend. Uh, we've therefore got to be really, uh, as I say, focused uh, in the decisions that we've got to make if we want to substantially shift the dial uh, on reducing poverty. And, and <coughs> Uh, Colette, uh, I, I gather we've got a little latitude to overrun, uh, but not a lot. So I, I think particularly in terms of the responses, First Ministers, I know you want to give uh, as expansive mm -hmm. answers as you can, but in order to get the questions in, we might need a bit more brevity. But Colette, back to you for uh, a final Thanks. question. Thanks, Convener. And I, I want to thank the First Minister um, for that answer and for, dealing, for detailing some of the steps the Scottish Government has taken to tackle um, Throughout the, the day and low-income inquiry, the Social Justice Committee heard a lot of evidence about some of the detri detrimental aspects of the UK government's welfare system, and in particular the two-child limit, the benefit cap, the five-week wait, and the, the differential rate paid for parents under 25 as well. So this was highlighted in the committee's report, Robin Peter to pay Paul low-income and the debt trap. Again, I'd be interested to hear from the First Minister's response to this, and can you share any of the Scottish Government's own analysis, which has been done and how, and to how many people in Scotland could potentially be lifted out of the poverty trap if key UK welfare reforms were reversed? Okay, um, team, uh, the convener's uh, queue, I've tried to be uh, less loquacious, uh, if I can be. Um, in terms of uh, our own analysis. We have done analysis. I'm happy to provide uh, Colette Stevenson perhaps with detail uh, in writing uh, to go into to, 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 um, to, to expand upon the answer. Um, but the top line of that uh, analysis shows that uh, when it comes to uh, the various, various UK government welfare reforms, if the key ones uh, were reversed uh, that have occurred since 2015, um, there's an we, would, we would bring an estimated 70,000 people out of poverty. So just just reversing some of those key welfare, uh, regressive welfare reforms that have occurred since 2015, 70,000 people uh, would be brought out of poverty. And that includes 
uh, 30,000 children uh, as well. Um, so we have, uh, as I say, some, some detail of that analysis in terms of what various different interventions, if we reverse them, could do. Um, you know, for example, uh, when it comes to reinstating the £20 uplift that I've already mentioned and, uh, to, to universal credit, reversing the benefit freeze, reversing the two-child limit, removal of the family element of that, each of those interventions uh, would, 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 just in isolation, bring around 10,000 children uh, out of poverty. So uh, just again, taking the uh, convener's cue uh, in the interest of brevity, I'm happy to uh, get a written note with the detail of that um, analysis. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, I've got a brief supplementary from Claire Baker. Claire? Um, thank you. It's just about women in poverty. One of the ways to um, get women out of poverty is to empower uh, women. And the Anna Stewart report was published in February. At the time, the First Minister said there would be a quick uh, response to the report. So can the First Minister let us know when the Government will respond to the report and what progress has been made with the Women's Business Centre, which there's money committed to? Uh, so the report, uh, the response to the report uh, should be imminent uh, in that regard, um, and uh, I know it's an issue that's been raised with me uh, by other members uh, as well. Forgive me, I don't have uh, the detail on the Women's uh, Business Centre. I'm happy to take that uh, one away and come back to Claire Baker uh, with uh, detail. Um, I should say we are uh, committed to doing everything we can in relation to ensuring uh, that we have uh, more women uh, in work. Obviously, uh, our uh, most generous offer in the UK in relation to childcare, free childcare, uh, is important uh, in that regard, but also the work that we're doing in relation to Fair Nation to 2025, uh, which looks at much of the work uh, in relation to, to reducing the gender pay gap, for example, uh, is really crucial uh, to this. But in terms of uh, the Women's Business Centre, I'll endeavour to come back to uh, Claire Baker in due course. Uh, Audrey Nicholl, uh, Convener, Criminal Justice Committee. Audrey. Thank you, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I am very aware that the First Minister will be aware of the important role of the Criminal Justice Committee in improving uh, victims' experience in the criminal justice system. And the Criminal Justice Committee has recently been supporting the campaign of Ellie Wilson and others, uh, others to allow survivors of rape and serious sexual offences to have free access to transcripts of their court cases. Um, this is a very important um, issue uh, because at present they are being charged potentially thousands of pounds for this. So while the committee understands that this is a matter largely for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, will the First Minister give us commitment to consider a pilot for accessing free transcripts so that survivors of rape can use these transcripts either as part of their recovery or to support any future civil process? I can thank Audrey Nicholl uh, for uh, the important points that she raises. And can I start by paying tribute to Ellie Wilson and the many other survivors who have chosen to, to, to either wave their anonymity or speak publicly um, about their case? Um, you know, I think every single one of us could, uh, could completely understand if they wanted to just deal with the trauma uh, of uh, the dreadful uh, sexual offence uh, that, that, uh, that has happened, but the fact that they are wanting to share their story in order to make things better for future survivors, uh, I think, uh, is to their credit and should be commended. Uh, I met with Ellie Wilson. She was um, a part of a roundtable uh, that I hosted with survivors uh, when we launched the Victims' Witnesses. Uh, and justice uh, reform bill, and uh, uh, actually, for anybody that does follow Ellie, um, you will see that uh, you know some of the responses to our social media posts uh, will remind you of just how much work we still have to do in combating rape myths and uh, myths around uh, survivors of, of rape and sexual uh, offences cases. Um, in terms of, she did raise this issue around transcripts uh, with me at the time uh, as well. Um, forgive me, this letter hasn't arrived uh, to the committee yet, but certainly uh, the Justice and Home, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home uh, Affairs um, uh, was planning uh, to write to the committee uh, this week, um, expressing certainly the government's commitment to uh, supporting a pilot um, to support access to transcripts and, and initially uh, focused on complainers and sexual offences um, cases. So it is an issue I'm uh, well aware of, given my previous role as Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, we will absolutely commit to a pilot uh, focused initially uh, in relation to complainers and sexual offences cases. 
Thank you very much. I mean, very, very welcome update, First Minister. I'm grateful for that. I wonder if we can just turn to the issue of policing and mental health. The Scottish Government's Fresh Start document states that the Government will support Police Scotland to have the capacity to respond to changing demands. And one of the huge demands placed on the police is the expectation that they will respond to incidents involving people in poor mental health. Now, this places a huge and a growing strain on police officers and staff when perhaps other services are better placed to respond uh, and officers can often wait many hours before being able to transfer the care of, a, of an individual into a more suitable service. So will the First Minister commit to working with the committee uh, and others such as HMICS and the Scottish Police Federation to review the demands placed on the police from this issue uh, and look at uh, models, for example, one in Humberside, which means that people uh, who uh, do call the police uh, can be um, transferred more quickly uh, to another service and perhaps without police attendance in the first place. Yes, yeah, I mean, we will absolutely um, commit to working, of course, with the committee and uh, Arjun Nichols should be in no doubt whatsoever that the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice and Home Affairs and the Cabinet Secretary uh, for uh, the, the, the NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care are working together uh, on this matter, as you would expect them uh, to do so. Uh, and certainly, uh, this is not a new issue, it's an issue that's come up uh, in, uh, over the years, and I'd like I need to tell Audrey Nicholl, given her, her, her past, uh, of course, uh, experience uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of interventions that we've brought forward to try to deal uh, with, this issue, with this issue. So we have the enhanced uh, mental uh, health pathway. Uh, we provided funding over £700,000 to Police Scotland to, do, to, to support the development of that pathway. And that's for those that are in distress, that are, those that are, are needing mental health support who come into contact with Police Scotland. And that pathway enables emergency recalls that are received by Police Scotland uh, that are identified as needing that particular mental health support and advice directed to a mental health hub within uh, NHS uh, 24. And that's a brilliant service, again, having uh, engaged with that as, as Health Secretary. You'll know about the Distress uh, Brief Intervention uh, Programme as well. Again, two weeks of that kind of personalised, um, compassionate distress support, that's, uh, the support that's required. Um, people who present to the police might not need urgent uh, intervention, um, but, but uh, or do not require, I suppose, emergency clinical intervention, but could do with that, uh, as I say, more personalised uh, two weeks uh, of support. Um, and there's a whole range of, of, of other interventions uh, as well um, that, uh, again, I can write to Audrey Nicol with the full detail of, uh, given, again, the um, uh, convener's uh, request for, for brevity. Thank you. Thank you very much. My body language is clearly communicating itself very well. We're going to move on to the theme of opportunity. I'm going to invite Claire Baker back in um, to start off the questions in this section. Claire. Uh, it's just a brief, a brief question. The committee have been looking at the disability employment gap. Um, there was a report came from Fraser of Allender Institute that said the government would need to make more progress, particularly on people with learning disabilities, um, if the target was to be met. Um, could the First Minister give us an update on work that's been taken forward on that? There wasn't really an emphasis on this in the 10-year economic strategy. Um, so what progress has been made in terms of meeting the target for closing the disability employment gap? Well, still, it still very much re remains uh, our ambition uh, to make sure that uh, we reduce that disability employment gap uh, by at least half by 2030, and that's in comparison, as you'll, you'll know, to the 2016 uh, baseline. Uh, the latest uh, full year data shows that the disability employment gap was uh, 31.9 percentage uh, points in 2022. Um, that is the second lowest. It's been uh, since our baseline year in 2016, so I believe we're on, on track uh, to meet the target to half the disability employment uh, gap. Um, in terms of uh, what more we're doing uh, in this regard, um, uh, I mentioned before the, the, the work in relation to the Fair Work uh, Nation. Uh, I think that's really crucial work because uh, what it's doing is, uh, of course, ensuring that we're looking at the intersectionalities that exist. Um, and, and uh, of course, what I mean by that is uh, for example, uh, if we have a person of colour that has a disability, uh, we've got to, we can do everything we want to do in order, and we should do in order to reduce uh, and dismantle the barriers for somebody who uh, has a disability to get into work. But if we don't also dismantle the racial barriers that exist, 
and that person is only going to progress so far. So I think the work we're doing in relation to Fair Nation, looking at the intersectionality uh, issues, I think are, are hugely important. So we've absolutely made uh, progress. Um, uh, the employment rate, uh, for example, of, of, of people with a disability has risen uh, from 42.8 per cent to, to 50.7 per cent between 2016 uh, and 2022. That's an increase of 7.9 per cent compared to an increase of 2.3 per cent compared to people uh, that do not have a disability. So um, we're making progress, uh, not complacent about it, um, um, but uh, I think we're on track to meet that uh, 2038 target. Uh, yeah, while I don't in any way dispute the figures, the Fraser of Allender have said there needs to be a greater understanding of the progress that's been made and have a proper audit because people, particularly those with learning disabilities, um, are still being left outside of the labour market. And as we see a tight labour market situation, there are opportunities for more people to gain employment. So could the government give a commitment that they, you've talked about the Fair Work Convention, but will we really analyse where progress has been made to ensure that there is equal opportunities for people and that people are able to access the workplace regardless of their disability. Yes, and forgive me, so I haven't seen the Fraser and Nevada <coughs> report that uh, Claire Baker references, so I will uh, make sure I look at uh, that after this committee session. So yes, absolutely. Uh, for, for a number of reasons. One, it is the right thing for us to do uh, mm -hmm. in a society that believes that there should be equality and equity of opportunity for all. It is absolutely the right thing for us to do, to dismantle those barriers. Uh, but secondly, it is in our economic interest to do so for all the reasons that Claire Baker rightly um, outlines in relation to a very tight uh, labour market uh, that we're experiencing, getting as many people in with as much support so they don't just end up in employment but uh, can, 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 can retain that employment, uh, I think is hugely important. So I will look at the report uh, that Claire Baker uh, references and, of course, absolutely committed to doing more uh, in this regard. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, First Minister. I'm now going to invite uh, John Mason. Uh, thanks again, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission recently came out with its Fiscal Sustainability Report, which looks well ahead to 2072-2073 and uh, talks about a significant annual budget gap by the time we get there. Can you tell anyth us anything about what the Scottish Government is thinking about that uh, and how they're projecting long term? I'm somewhat uh, weary of um, stealing the Deputy First Minister Thunder, of course. She's going to be uh, uh, outlining uh, tomorrow uh, the, the, the MTFS, uh, the Medium Term Financial uh, Strategy, and that will give an outlook not quite uh, as long as uh, articulated by uh, John Mason, but certainly uh, giving that medium term uh, outlook in terms of the finances. Uh, and again, without going into the detail of the MTFS, um, we are looking at what we can do in relation to taxation. Uh, we will also look to see what we can do in relation to economic growth. And there are signs, including from data and independent analysis we've never seen from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, that we have uh, greater and better prospects in relation to economic growth in the coming period uh, than we've had perhaps uh, in the preceding uh, period. So uh, we are uh, absolutely focused on interventions that can be high impact in relation to economic growth uh, for a purpose, so that we can reinvest in our public services, so we can help to reduce poverty, um, but at the same time, making sure we have and continue to have the most progressive taxation in the country, again, not for its own sake, uh, but for the sake of being able to invest uh, that, that, th th those funds into our public services and then into to tackling poverty. So um, I'll probably say, no more than that, other than uh, some of these issues will uh, be dealt with in detail in, in an update to Parliament tomorrow uh, by the Deputy First Minister. Uh, thank you for that. As, as a kind of more general question, um, clearly politicians tend to focus on the short term and the next election. Do you think it is possible to get Parliament and all the parties to look at the longer term, 50 years ahead, future generations? Because sometimes we have to make difficult short term decisions for our children and grandchildren. It's a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, I think we should, uh, for what it's worth. I think we absolutely should be in that space. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, that can always be more, more, more difficult in relation to, uh, depending on where we are in the electoral uh, election cycle. Um, I, I, I've often seen uh, in international examples as well as domestic examples that where there is that kind of broad consensus, there may not be unanim unanimity, but with this broad consensus, or an issue that needs long-term effort and investment, 
that's where you see the real radical change. So I remember speaking as Justice Secretary uh, to a, a Finnish politician, and, and Finland at one point had the highest prison population per head, and over a number of decades uh, ended up with, uh, if not the lowest in Western Europe, uh, in, in Europe, one of the lowest uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, and that was because there was a concerted effort. I remember him telling me very clearly that all of the political parties signed up to the fact that they had to reduce their rates of incarceration because they were just far too high. Uh, and, and although there was many a political argy bargy over a number of issues, uh, there was not. There was a collective agreement on the need to reduce the prison population. So um, I think where you can get that collective agreement, uh, and we should strive for that and lead in relation to, 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 to what we can do in government, uh, then, then, then I think that's where you see real transformative change. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, First Minister. We now go back to Edward Mountain for the next couple of questions. Edward. PRS is obviously a key issue, and when the net zero Energy and Transport Committee last looked at told by the Minister we would get a copy of the Gateway Review due at the end of March, as soon as it was available. Now, Fergus Hughes, I know, brought the issue up yesterday in Parliament, and he was told we we were getting it imminently. What does that mean? Um, we were promised it in, in April. Could you give me some indication of what that means, please, First Minister? Well, again, in terms of the gateway uh, review, given uh, that we are dealing uh, with a scheme that involves uh, industry partners, uh, that involves Circularity Scotland, a number of other stakeholders, uh, we just have to ensure uh, that uh, any review uh, takes into account some of those commercial sensitivities that might well uh, exist. So, uh, as Lorna Slater said, uh, in response to uh, my good uh, friend and colleague, uh, mm -hmm. Fergus Ewing, uh, that uh, we will look to see what we can publish and publish imminently. But the point about the deposit return scheme, of course, uh, is that uh, we can get on, we are, and we are getting on with the scheme in relation to go live uh, next uh, spring, the 1st of March 2024. But it's so important we get a positive decision around the exemption uh, from the Eternal Markets Act from the UK uh, government and not a conditional exemption, uh, not, for example, suggesting that they that they uh, remove or demand that we remove glass from the scheme, for example. We need a, an absolute exemption, and that will allow us uh, and give certainty to business uh, to get on with a really important scheme. Uh, and why it's so important, of course, is so we can see that uh, we can see that uh, hopefully uh, the removal uh, and the elimination, I would hope, of uh, uh, the, that, that litter that pollutes our streets uh, and our beaches. I'm not sure I got an answer there, but we've waited six weeks. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll have to wait a wee bit longer. Turning to the climate change, uh, I wonder what direction you've given to your new ministers on the climate change plan. The last first minister wanted all policies reviewed. Is that your position? And my other part of that question is, will you be chairing the cabinet subcommittee on climate? And what will your priorities be on that? For? Uh, yes, I, I will chair uh, the the. Uh, Sub-committee, uh, given, of course, the importance of this agenda, not just for the Scottish Government, I would hope for all of us, and of course for the entire uh, planet. Uh, in terms of looking at our policies, uh, we, of course, uh, have to respond uh, to the Climate Change uh, Committee's uh, report. We have to respond and will respond uh, before uh, the end uh, of uh, the year. We have to do that. Um, and we have to really be absolutely upfront and honest about how challenging the next phase of our net zero journey will be. So we've made good progress. We're over 50% of the way in relation to that net zero target. But we know getting to that 2030 target uh, is going to be extremely challenging and it's going to require really difficult decisions uh, to be made. And by the way, it will also cost a lot of money too. Um, you know, it doesn't matter which element of uh, action that needs to be taken. These are costly interventions, uh, but ones that will undoubtedly uh, be uh, necessary. So uh, we will absolutely uh, respond uh, to that report uh, in due course, uh, and we will. Uh, I am very ambitious uh, in relation to those targets to ensure that um, we are putting forward a pathway uh, to meeting those targets. And frankly, I mean, of course, these are illegal statutory targets, and uh, we have to make sure. Uh, that we are meeting them and certainly have a credible pathway to meeting them. 
Thank you. First Minister, um, we now move into what is uh, probably termed the, the miscellaneous category of, of questions left. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. It's uh, just regarding the SLC uh, bills. Also, uh, we know that there are there is a number of them um, already prepared and uh, ready to come into Parliament at some point. Um, and also, as you will be aware, First Minister, that the SLC bills are really just about uh, trying to uh, update uh, legislation to keep pace with uh, modern day uh, life and work. But in relation to the, these SLC bills and proposals, the Scottish Government is considering bringing forward uh, in any of the bills. What assessment is made of the possible contribution an SLC bill it can actually make towards Scotland achieving its net and zero targets? And are you able to update uh, this uh, conveners group on your thinking on future SLC bills? Uh, look, again, I've, uh, in, a, in, a, in a previous um, uh, role, had much engagement with uh, uh, the SLC, with the Scottish Law uh, Commission, um, and uh, I think the work that they do greatly adds value to the work that we do collectively in this parliament, and certainly the work of, of, of government. And since 2015, we've taken forward uh, no fewer than, than six SLC bills, and um, all those bills have been implemented, with the exception of, uh, obviously, just recently excuse me, past movable transactions uh, bill. Uh, we've also committed uh, to consider a number of other SLC reports during this session. Um, we are, um, uh, of course, a couple of years into this uh, particular session, and we've already brought forward two SLC bills, uh, as, uh, as Drew McMillan knows well. Uh, we're also considering uh, the SLC's report on judicial factors uh, as well. So I, I think there's great value, uh, whether it's in, in, in the issues uh, of the day uh, that are that are the foremost and upfront of our mind, uh, but actually often it uh, can be the case with SLC bills uh, they're quite nuanced in relation to the issues that they focus on, uh, but extremely important to those that are impacted and affected. So uh, I'm very very keen to continue that um, good engagement with the SLC. <laughs> Oh, thanks very much, First Minister. I'm now going to come to Martin uh, Whitfield um, to ask a question on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Excellent. Thank, Thank you very much, Convener. And First Minister, can I welcome you to your um, post? I'm going to roll my two questions into one because I am conscious of time. Obviously, since becoming First Minister, there's been a substantial change both in the personnel um, of the Scottish Government but also their responsibilities. Um, I'm sure, as First Minister, you will agree that the committee remits uh, are the responsibility of this parliament uh, to follow the ministerial and cabinet secretary portfolios. And um, can I invite you to confirm that the Scottish Government would, of course, support the parliament in any changes that it felt necessary. But coming to that point, we have had a challenge in the publication of the responsibilities of both cabinet secretaries and first ministers. Indeed, for a substantial period of time, there were two ministers who were answering to no cabinet secretary. Now, here in Scotland, the role of First Minister is the statutory um, minister that is responsible for all of these. But again, today, we've heard in respect of COVID recovery that the Deputy First Minister is the responsible Cabinet Secretary for that. But again, this does not appear in the list of responsibilities of the Cabinet Secretary, either as a cross-government responsibility or a budget responsibility, nor does it appear in any of the supporting ministers for that Cabinet Secretary. Do you agree, First Minister, that it's quite challenging for Parliament to leverage transparency and to hold the government to account if we're not sure where responsibilities lie within the Scottish Government? I think that's a really fair point from uh, Martin at Whitfield. And, uh, you know, there is that uh, initial period, and it has been uh, two months, of course, but there is that initial period uh, when a new First Minister comes in and a new government uh, is appointed where there will be a change of responsibilities. And um, uh, sometimes there will be bullet points uh, that we may have to update in relation to uh, the remit's roles and responsibilities. So I'll certainly uh, look at that and, really, and, and if we can make that uh, absolutely explicit. Um, uh, we, we should do that, uh, and, and we will do that. Um, in terms of uh, uh, committees uh, restructuring in, in, in order to reflect ministerial and cabinet secretary responsibilities, of course, that's a matter for committees. I would support uh, whatever committees uh, feel needs done uh, in that regard and in that respect. But I'll, I'll, I'll take away uh, and to have a look at the list of responsibilities. They can uh, often, at the uh, discretion of the First Minister, also we can, uh, after a, a bit of 
uh, embedding between the Cabinet Secretary and the Junior Minister may look to make changes, but we should be absolutely up front uh, in that regard if there are movements, for example, from the Cabinet Secretary's portfolio to the Junior Minister's portfolio and vice versa. Uh, and that can happen, as I say, just through uh, once those positions become slightly more uh, embedded. But I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that um, we are uh, as transparent as possible in that and certainly up front in that regard. Thank you. I think we're living up to successfully to the title of Miscellany um, in this uh, section. I'm going to invite John Mason to ask the next question. John. Hey, thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, the question of commissioners or office holders has come up to the Finance Committee and I think obviously affects all committees because different, both the government and uh, other members are bringing forward proposals for other commissioners. So I just wonder if the government has a view as to uh, what is the, the ideal number of commissioners? Is it one? Is it ten? Is it hundred? Uh, where are we going with this? Because it seems to be falling between stools between the Parliament and the government. So I, I, mean, I won't uh, pick a number um, out of thin air necessarily, but I, I do share John Mason's uh, concern uh, at times that we can um, or, or can be viewed that a commissioner uh, is going to be the panacea to a particular challenge or issue. Uh, that is being faced and I think we've got to be uh, careful that what we don't end up doing because commissioners can absolutely play an important role in holding government to account often challenging parliament to go further um, what we don't end up doing is uh, cluttering a, a landscape that can sometimes already be too cluttered um, plus also there can be confusion about what a particular commissioner can or cannot do um, and I think we've got to make sure that um, we are not raising an expectation unfairly uh, to the public as well. So I, I, I wouldn't give a view on the right or wrong uh, number, but I just want to give an assurance, at least to John Mason, that we're very, very alive to the issues that he raises and try to take as considered a view on that as we possibly can. Thanks very much, uh, First Minister. I'm conscious that we're just right up against time, but I'm also conscious there was a couple of colleagues that were unable to attend uh, the meeting. Uh, and I know Sue Webber, the Convener of Education, Children and Young People, had a couple of questions. If, if um, you can indulge me, perhaps, uh, First Minister, I'll, I'll, I'll go through one of them, at, uh, at least, um, to try and elicit a response. Um, so Sue wrote that the uh, committee notes the First Minister's intention to increase the availability of internationally comparable data on Scotland's education performance. However, the committee's recent work on the disabled children young people tra transitions to adulthood Scotland bill suggests that there are large data gaps closer to home, not least in relation to the number of coordinated support plans in place for children and young people. Uh, and uh, Sue Weber wants to know how the uh, First Minister intends to address that data gap. Again, I'm, I'm more than happy to look into detail on this. In, in uh, November of last year, uh, the additional support for learning action plan update showed good progress uh, against a number of key action and this included very much that uh, forward uh, taking forward work from a review of the use of coordinated support plans to ensure they were they were used uh, appropriately uh, the framework uh, also recognizes that some learners may need more targeted support for example that one-to-one -one support uh, from a PSA from a, a pupil support uh, assistant um, so, so there are uh, more. There is more work on this. I'm, I'm very keen for us to take uh, forward. Um, we've worked on, with partners uh, in relation to coordinated support plans uh, on the on the CSP Short Life Working Group uh, to understand where the barriers to implementation are of the legislation uh, related to CSPs and how they can be addressed. Um, and, and we'll continue to take forward the work from that report that was published. Uh, in, in 2021. Uh, so uh, there are recommendations there for us to follow up on. Some of them have progressed. Uh, some of them we need to take forward, we know, with uh, greater urgency and pace. Thank you, uh, First Minister. Thank you um, both yourself and to colleagues. Uh, we managed to get through uh, all of the questions. And thank you also, First Minister, for your commitment to come back on uh, with further detail to some of the questions that were posed. I would hope we're able to repeat this exercise in around six months' time and uh, we'll liaise with your office, First Minister, about a suitable date for that. But thank you very much for your attendance. The next meeting of uh, the Conveners Group will be uh, Wednesday, 31st of May. Um, so thank you all. Uh, have a good afternoon. And I close this meeting. Mm -hmm.